All right, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, and uh, we started last week with a series of messages on the end times and are we in the end times. We believe that we're getting very near. We know many people, most Christians throughout of history have said the same thing, but we truly believe Obviously, scripturally, it's not getting better and better. It's getting worse and worse. And Paul made that clear to his churches. And tonight, I have entitled the message, The Great Escape. And you know what I'm going to talk about. And that, what we believe here is the rapture of the church. And uh, the Lord is going to come and take us out before what we talked a little bit about last week of that great tribulation. We started last week talking about this present age and where we are in that and all that God is doing to set things up. Now we know that between the first and second, we call Advent, coming of Christ, God has very special plans and two distinct programs He's bringing to fulfillment. One is the church, one is Israel. And there is a distinction, and God is still working in both. We must be careful about not casting aside Israel. Now God is working openly with the church. We know that. Our primary purpose is to preach the word, preach the gospel. It's getting Jews and Gentiles alike saved. We're propagating the truth. And that's what we talked about last week. Sower went out to sow. We're sowing the seed and doing all that we can and being a good influence in this world, but knowing we're not ruled by this world. Now God is behind the scenes working right now with the church, but also with Israel. He's bringing about the nations and putting them in line for His kingdom, His thousand-year reign on this earth. We think about it. As much as we love the United States of America, as we do, and we're so appreciative of all that have given their lives and all that we have here in America, America is not the most important nation, is it? Uh, Israel is the most important nation. We know that. And um, coming back to see this, now the church is what we call an intervention within the program of God for Israel. As we said a little last week, we're at kind of an intervention stage, the church is. We call it the uh, church age or the age of grace that we live in. You know that's from the time of the crucifixion, of cross, the, the cross, basically, and all the way up to where we are today is this time period. And uh, it's wonderful to be living in this period, by the way. We know that. But he has a program. He's not done with Israel. He's not put them aside. But because of their rejection of his first coming, he then turned to the church, didn't he? We know that. He came and presented himself to Israel. And he said, here am I. Basically, I'm the Messiah. They brought him in. They sang Hosanna in the highest. He rode in on the donkey. They waved the palm leaves. And then just a few short little time later, they ended up crucifying him, arrested and crucified And by the way, uh, that trial, that arrest was an illegal arrest. It was an illegal trial that they put him through. We'll cover that another time, but I'm reading a book on that right now. But we think about now that he has a plan for the church. Now, I said all that. Let's come back to 1 Thessalonians 4. You folks know your Bible, so you know where I'm, I'm going. But notice verse 13. He says here, I would not have you ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep or that have died, that ye sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is a great passage we know uh, that we refer to as the rapture. That word there, caught up, we get our word, you know, rapture from. And we think about here, it's really used, and this is something that's very divided today among Christians. You know that. Many believers believe that there will be a rapture prior to this tribulation, which we believe is called pre-trib, and others believe there's a mid-trib, there's a post-trib, and there's several others that I don't even know about. But you think about, there's a lot of division on this. As we think about here tonight, we believe that there will be a time coming very soon when God will call us out. And by the way, it's probably when we'll be asleep, but we won't be paying attention, will it? 
He declares that to us. Now, what is this event that's going to take place? We know the church at Thessalonica was confused about several. They thought they were already going through the tribulation. They said, now, Paul, a lot of our loved ones have died. What's going to happen to them? And Paul had to clarify to these folks that they are not in the tribulation. It's not come yet. He said there will be a setting up for that. And we're going to see here just a minute a few things. I want you to notice with me here. Number one. Uh, it is the bridegroom coming to take his bride to his father's house for the wedding. Now, the church is a special relationship to Christ as Israel had to Jehovah of the Old Testament. The church is described as a virgin espoused to her husband, waiting for him to return. Paul makes this clear in 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 2. He says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Ephesians 5.25, he says, again, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for it. He might sanctify, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to, notice, himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. It should be holy and without blemish. Now, a few things here to notice. The Jewish marriage had a number of steps. By the way, I'm glad we don't have these steps anymore. <laughs> these, are, these are difficult steps. The Jewish marriage, listen to some of these. Number one, there was the betrothal. Uh, the prospective groom traveled from his father's house to the home of the prospective bride and paid the purchase price. He had to pay for it. Uh, we're, we're paying for our wives right now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, you had to pay a price. And I kind of like that, having girls now. I'm thinking, yeah, well, you, how much, how much <laughs> what, do you what do you want to give me? Uh, paid the price. Now, this established the marriage covenant. Uh, Galatians 4, verse 4, he says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. So there was the betrothal. Number two, there was the waiting period before the wedding. Now the groom would then return to his father's house, which meant remaining separate from his bride, for at least 12 months. That'd be tough. Twe a whole year, you couldn't see your sweetheart, you know, your husband, your wife. And you think about, boy, that'd be tough. And it's waiting period. During this time, he would prepare the living accommodations for his wife in his father's house. John 14, you know, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. He goes on to tell him, I'll come again and receive you. Talking about that same process of a Jewish, uh, Jewish marriage. There's a waiting period. Thirdly, then the groom comes for his bride at a time not known exactly to her. The goal was to surprise the bride uh, and come in. And she would, uh, uh, by the way, women don't like to be surprised, do they? <laughs> no, they don't. Honey, people are coming over. What? You know? He, he came at a time un unexpected. Now, that's what we just read. Unexpected. He says it will come at a time, an event, right? That is a shout, a voice of an archangel. At a blink of an eye, he says, you know, there in 1 Corinthians. He to, to return with her to the groom's father's house to celebrate the wedding feast. So that's a clear indication of what's happening. Letter B, it is the event that sets the stage for the return of the Lord to rule the world. Now go to 2 Thessalonians with me here real quick. Turn over a few pages. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And he says now, notice verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... By our gathering together into Him, notice that, ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by any uh, by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, that no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all uh, that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Uh, so again, it sets the stage for the return of the Lord. There's several things there that we'll look at. But notice next, when will this take place? Now the Bible presents this event uh, as imminent, meaning that we are to expect it at any time. This also means that we don't know the exact time it'll happen. Now this is one reason I truly believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, the imminency that's presented all throughout the Bible. And uh, one fella was uh, talking with another guy I read, and 
he, he said, well, I believe we're post-trib. We're going to go through the tribulation. He said, well, what kind of blessed hope is that if we go through that? And he talked a little bit with him and tried to convince him of coming back to this pre-trib uh, uh, angle, if you will, or belief, I should say. So it's the imminency. There's something there that we are to look forward to. The second advent is preceded, you know, by signs, wonders. There's things that are going to happen, specific things that we're going to look at. No, those on this earth are going to see. And we'll obviously be with Christ. When will this take place? Now, we don't know the exact time. It's a secret as to the exact date. Uh, you know, in Acts 1, verse 7, he said, He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put into his power, in his own power. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, of, of the times and seasons, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a, as a thief in the night. He says you don't need to know. You just serve the Lord, be faithful, sowing the seeds, and God will take care of the business. It's a secret. It is next on God's calendar of events. Now you know these things, I know. But again, like I said Sunday, it's good that we're reminded of these things and rehash them. It encourages us to think about them. Now, it's the next event. Nothing else has to happen. There's no big earthquake. There is no blood moon. There is no stars that are aligned in certain shape for the rapture to take place. Nothing has to happen. It is and could happen at any time. The Bible is very clear as to the basic order of the major events of the second coming. The rapture is the next event. It takes place before the millennium. We know before the tribulation, before the judgment seat of Christ and before Armageddon. It is next. There's no signs to look for. This is based on the normal, literal method of interpretation. As you read through the Bible, as you study the Bible, we call that, in particular, hermeneutics. You know that. If you take the Bible for what it is, literal interpretation. By the way, when the Bible is figurative, it will tell you it's figurative. When it's literal, it'll tell you it's literal. You don't have, it doesn't take a lot of education, if you will, to understand that, you know it. So we take, in our church, we believe that we read the Bible for literal interpretation, normal. It is simply stated, you interpret the Bible by allowing the words to mean what they say and say what they mean. I wish more people would do that, don't you? <laughs> say what you mean and mean what you say. No him hawing around or this passive aggressiveness. Say what you mean. And uh, unless it's clearly indicated by the passage, they're not to be taken literally. We've been through that before. Uh, secondly, under this point, it's based on a dispensational interpretation of the Bible. Uh, this recognizes a distinct difference between the church and Israel. God has a divine plan for each. They're two separate. They don't overlap. We know in the Bible the church is a mystery, meaning it's not been revealed prior to that. It's a mystery. It's something unknown. Paul says to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, what's he say? This is a mystery. Let me share with you a mystery, meaning not something we can't understand, it's something that's pre that has not previously been revealed. And so the church is truly a mystery, we know. A um, few things here, let me jump ahead. It's in this present age, the church age, we know, we already covered that. This mystery program must be completed before God can resume His program with Israel and bring them to the kingdom age. This is based on the promise given to the church, that the Lord has delivered us from the wrath to come. Now back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he says this, 1 Thessalonians, I think it's verse 10, yeah, chapter 1, verse 10, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us, notice, from the wrath to come. Very clear to us. This is based on the promises of, uh, given to the church. We're, we are to, uh, we're not appointed to this wrath. Again, he says in uh, chapter 5, verse 9, uh, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be delivered from the hour of temptation. He says in Revelation 3, verse 10 and 22. So this is something just to think about. Uh, the next question is, what will happen at the rapture? Very interesting. Now again, back in uh, chapter 4 here, 1 Thessalonians 4, he makes it clear to us. What's going to happen? First, there will be a resurrection of the dead in Christ. Now, you know what that means. Those saved believers, people that have been saved, a resurrection. This is the beginning of the first resurrection talked about in John 5, Revelation 20, other places. 
The first resurrection is the resurrection of the just before the millennium. Uh, the second resurrection is the resurrection of the damned before the millennium. I was reading just this week, and I thought I kind of laughed at it, but uh, you remember when Jesus was crucified. Uh, I believe it's in Matthew, the account Matthew gives. But he was crucified and all the things that took place. And uh, there was an earthquake and darkness and all those things. And it said that, what, saints, some of the saints in the past came up out of the graves and went into the city. <laughs> I like that. Because you know what happened. Probably Elijah went in. He probably went into the temple and started talking with the <laughs> uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and everyone else around there. And, uh, other, I can't imagine, but I just I chuckled at that. I didn't ever really stop to study that before, but I thought, man, that's a fascinating to me. Now again, there will be people obviously resurrected out of the graves, and that's one of the first things that's going to happen. You know that. This is the first resurrection. And uh, this is the resurrection of only the dead in Christ and all of the dead in Christ. And then, uh, secondly, there will be a sudden change of the living in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Again, we shall not all die. We shall all be changed, though, in a moment, twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Trumpet shall sound, uh, and the dead in Christ, uh, excuse me, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and the we shall be changed. Now I heard a couple of people say, at the last Trump, well, they all thought that was the President Trump. When Trump is done, then he's going to come. I kind of like that. <laughs> I hope he comes back. I was hoping it would be today, you know, at the inauguration. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> He'd just come out of the sky, take us all out. Uh, but you think here, now he says it'll be sudden, sudden, sudden change to the living. We read this a couple weeks ago, but Philippians 3, verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change, listen to this, our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the work, a working whereby is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Uh, you know 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we, do, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our bodies, our, we will be instantly changed. And aren't you thankful for that? We will have our new bodies, and we will be with Christ forever. And uh, next week, we'll get into a little more of what's going to happen after the, the, the rapture takes place. But we're going to have a wonderful time. There's going to be that marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to enjoy a wonderful time of fellowship with our Savior and uh, several things, other things that will happen. But it's a sudden event, sudden change to us, there will be a departure from the earth. This is very clear. Uh, now, sadly, families will be disrupted, as you know. And uh, I, people see the tribulation as a tremendously hard time. It's going to be terrible, horrible time. The worst time this earth has ever seen during the tribulation. But we're going to see family members that are not saved. They're going to come to Christ during that time. <laughs> because when mom and dad are gone, or brother, sister, or something, you know, they're going to go, okay, uh, they were right. But sadly, families will be disrupted. Families will be divided. Churches are going to be disrupted. Sadly, churches, there's many people in the church that aren't saved, and we know that. And Paul makes that clear to us. There are those within, as we talked about a little bit last week, the wheat and the tares. Should we go and pull them out? What's the harvest or the farmer say? The Lord says what? No, no, let them grow. Let them grow. I'll take care of it at the end. There are those within the church and within this, uh, what we call Christianity today, that will be, they'll be divided. Cemeteries will be disrupted. We know that. We can't wait to see some of that. But just some things to think about. There will be a departure from this earth. There will be a rejoicing because of victory. He says again in 1 Corinthians 15, But thanks be to God, which giveth, uh, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Over death in the grave, I hate going to funerals. I hate seeing loved ones uh, lowered slowly down to that cold, hard earth. I hate that. And one day, we won't have to deal with that anymore. And I'm so thankful. But now, we're sowing the seed, aren't we? We're sharing with the people around us the wonderful news of the gospel. But there will be rejoicing. There will be victory forevermore over this frail body and over this sin that we deal with daily. You ever live your life? I know you do, and you're doing so well spiritually, and then something happens. <laughs> that old adversary throws something right in our path, 
tries to distract, tries to irritate us, tries to throw us off and get our testimony out and all those things. But there's victory over that coming very soon. Let me wrap up here lastly. Revelation 21, 4, he says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. I like he added that, don't you? No crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Pain is an indicator that we're frail, we're finite. We uh, are dying. Day, from the day you're born, you're dying. Every day you die, and you feel it in your body. But you think about, we are going to have the victory over all of that. And then here, lastly, there will be a great reunion, a great reunion. Now, notice chapter 4, verse 17 again. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, with them, those loved ones, those people that have gone before us. Maybe some of you, mother, father, uh, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, maybe even children, together with them. This is something, this is what we look forward to is the blessed hope of the believer. And we're excited about it. You should be too. There will come latter, in the latter time, those, as Peter says, that will scoff and say, well, where is he got? Why isn't she left yet? He said this from the beginning. No, we stick to the word of God and we trust him. But there will be a great reunion with our loved ones. And then obviously with the Lord Jesus Christ. With them to meet the Lord in the air. To meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I love that. Ever be. Ever be. Lord, do we have to go back? No. You're always with me. Do we have to do this again? No. You'll ever be with me. With the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in 1 John again, It doth not appear what we shall be, but we know when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Revelation 22, 4. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. We will be identifying with Lord. Are you prepared to meet Him? Uh, again, just a cautionary thing to all of us, but are you prepared tonight? Do you know that? Um, again, dealing with some of our younger children, but we know, are you prepared? And this is something we need to emphasize with people around us, right? Are you ready? Are you ready? And most people laugh at that, scoff at it. We believe, though, scripturally that we Understand, there is an event coming very soon that will be sudden. And I don't want to have to go through the tribulation. I know you don't want to, but are you ready for that? Are you prepared? Are you born again? Are you ready to meet him? It's a sudden event. We should be looking for it. Be ready for it. And he says later that we would be found of him in peace. We'd be where we're supposed to be, really. And yes, we'll meet him in the air if we're saved, but are you where you're supposed to be spiritually? in those things. Now, uh, we're going to get into uh, next week, hopefully, Lord willing, um, we're going to see that there is also this time, a wonderful time where we spend with the Lord Jesus Christ. While this tribulation is going on, we're not up there twiddling our thumbs or biting our nails, nervous about what's... No, we're going to be with the Lord and enjoying a wonderful time, a wonderful time. The marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to get rewards. We're going to get all those things that we hope for. The crowns that we talked about and we're hoping for. And so I hope that you're ready for that. But are you ready tonight for him? I hope he comes back very soon. And I know you do as well. There's a great escape. Great escape coming. And I always think of old uh, Steve McQueen. Was it him? He jumped the old fence with the motorcycle. Remember that? <laughs> and he escaped and all the guys, yeah, yeah, you know, hoping and hooting and hollering. And I'm excited because one day we're going to be out of this old world, this old body, we'll be with him forevermore. Okay, I'll stop there. But are you ready? Are you ready? Lord, thank you for tonight, the time to spend in your word. I thank you for the opportunity to share. Although these folks know these things, I'm sure, but uh, we're thinking about, Lord, that we need to have an, a readiness about us, Lord, as we think about um, that you could return at any time. We're ready for that. I pray that, Lord, you'd help us with those around us to share the gospel with our children, especially as well, at that right time. You'd give us discernment there as parents. Lord, give us your strength, reaching the people around us that seem so hardened towards the gospel. They don't want anything to do with it. They could care less. But give us your wisdom and strength and discernment to do what we're supposed to do is sowing the seed. And Lord, we're so excited. We're, we're really excited to think about we're going to be with you forevermore. 
no more pain, no more crying, and reunited with those loved ones that have gone before. We love and thank you, Lord, once again. Be with these tonight, these prayer requests we mentioned. In Jesus' name we do pray these things, and amen. Amen. Thank you.